Thank you. So we are back online. Lot of beers, coke, on vegetables, on things like that. Good discussion together uh, during the break. So we are back online with the people on the on the web. I hope they enjoy the first talk and ready for the second one. So your turn. Okay. So now it's time to introduce the second guest of this evening, Marina Shakur. She's a trained and highly skilled lettering artist and designer, born in Sao Paulo in Brazil. She's graduated with MA from London College of Communication in graphic design and following up with a second MA in type and media at KHBK. After a few years, she decided to move to The Hague, where she says having found a home. As you will probably very soon discover by yourself, Marina is full of energy, involved in many conferences, lectures, workshops, and exhibitions worldwide. She has also served as a board member for ATP for six years. Her work presents a very rich diversity from unlettering to letterpress, designing mainly for brands, books, and magazines. Marina also developed personal projects and collaborations, which appears for me, I think, as significant as her commissioned works and shows connection between the two. Marina loves curves, type ornaments, pattern, handmade and digital drawing. She has experimented many tools for drawing letters, such as washi tape, I think it's Japanese one, and elastics. These letterings express a true joy and energy and reflect the pleasure of working. Marina is also a perfectionist designer who produce a number of sketches, you can see it on her website, often till the deadline, to reach a delicate balance between mastery and expressivity. Please welcome Marina Shakur. Thank you very much, Camille, that was such an honor to have a very thoughtful introduction. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> Hola, Paris. I know it's not French, it's Portuguese. Well, <laughs> I'll try to stay on this side. Uh, I hope you have... Oops, thank you. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> It was, I had a Hollywood moment here. Well, uh, thank you very much for the organization, for having invited me for this year's edition. I'm having a great time. I hope you had uh, the opportunity during the break to look at the students' work over there on the wall. They worked really hard today and came up with great results for a very complicated briefing. So please, a round of applause for this year's students of Thai Paris. Well done, guys. Well, I'm usually full of energy, but as Camille said, uh, I'm, I just arrived from New York where I was in two conferences and meetings, and I'm a bit still jet lagged and very tired. So I might mix languages and be maybe not make so much sense. So please bear with me and ask if you need, if you need help or if there's something wrong. Anyway, hello. And my talk is titled Type Life. And this is sort of a, a spin-off from a talk I did last year in Portugal. Because I, I was invited to be the keynote speaker for the, um, one of the keynote speakers for uh, the Portuguese type event that's called Encontro de Espografia. And it's um, unusual for me to be here like on stage talking about my own work. Usually I talk about other people's work, introduce them in conferences, or I'm working behind the scenes. But it's um, 
it's a great exercise to prepare a presentation where you're thinking about the things that you're doing and the process that you have and why you do certain things the way you do. And the title is Type Life because I think, like I feel that my life is mostly within the type industry and with the things that I do and the people that I meet and whenever I'm traveling, even for vacations, I'm traveling to meet friends that I have in different countries that are also in the type industry. Anyway, you see what this is about. And also I'm thinking, you know, it's, it's kind of weird like, to share. It would be a very personal talk and sometimes it's when you expose something that you're thinking about and what made you, you know, take that road and those decisions and why you think, think certain things in this way and that way. Uh, it's, it's very, it's kind of vulnerable to be in this position and share such personal thoughts and processes. But then uh, a few years back, I think it was two years ago, that Christoph Niemann was at a um, stage at Tipo, uh, Tipo Berlin. And his talk was highly inspirational to me. And when he was sharing what he was thinking about his work and that, you know, working to the deadline and budget and then he consider his work is not good enough and you're thinking like, what? What the hell? Like this person also thinks, like, like when you, you have those feelings, like what I'm doing is not good enough. And you're thinking, oh, you know, like this is a pretty human feeling to have and it's okay to share that on stage. So great, let's, let's go for it then. Um, so these are things that usually come across my mind and perhaps other people's minds and it's something that is highly known that things to consider when you're doing commercial work. So fun, fame and fortune and cost, time and quality. So for instance, if you get, like if I get a commission project, if it's just one of those three, if it's just fun or it just has some exposure or it's just a good payment, mm, it doesn't get me that excited. It's really rare to find a project that brings all of the three. But if you have two elements, good to go. Uh, especially the fun part. And then the, the other part is the, the triangle with the cost, time and quality, uh, which is, I think is pretty well known that it, you cannot have the three of them, something that is cheap, that is fast and it's great. Right? Like usually, if you, if, you ha if you need something that is fast and it's, um, and it's cheap, maybe the quality is not that perfect because that person didn't have time to, um, to edit, to go over it or something like that. And well, you know the triangle, how it works. But then uh, these are some of the commission things that I work on. And uh, the first one is handwriting for a book for a um, beer brand, a big agency in Brazil. Uh, the second one is lettering, uh, so sorry, calligraphy for a magazine. Third, uh, lettering for a book cover. Then there's letterpress for a compilation of posters. Uh, typography, this one is for type together. And type design. Uh, it's a custom typeface for a Brazilian portal of news and content. Uh, some of the things, I think, yeah, some of the things I did on my own and then some others I had collaboration. But, so I kind of work in different things within the letter form world. And besides that, also behind the scenes, organizing conferences and doing other things. That makes me think about, you know, I think who lived in the, well, who was a kid in the 80s. I don't know in France and other countries if you ever saw something like that. Yeah? Okay, so that goes with the age, you know? <laughs> uh, for those who don't know about this, it was a um, pencil case and that had those buttons on top and every time you press something, something came out. So then the, you know, the pencil sharpener came up or the place for the razor came out, and then there were some lenses on this part and a thermometer, like there were so many things going on at the same time. And I remember my grandfather saying, you know, who tries to do a lot of things, of different things, they don't do any of them well. And I think, you know what? I think we are pretty good nowadays, because <laughs> our phones are just not a phone, you know, like it go, does, performs, many different things. 
And lately I was thinking about people in different, like previous centuries, or even not, not that long ago, but one of the most famous um, Brazilian graphic designers, he was also a lawyer, you know, and, and, and then you, see, you see people's um, biographies, it was like, yeah, he was astronomer, a doctor, a lawyer, a philosopher, you know, like, you know what? Doing things within the type industry, it's pretty good, it's pretty focused, right? <laughs> um, but then, leaving the, the, the commission part outside and, yeah, projects where I'm paid to do them, I'll be focusing on the personal projects and things where I have more freedom to think about them and one special thing about it, which is time. But I'll get to that in a second, because then if I'm considering the commercial projects to be within those three things, either the, the fun, fame, and fortune, of course, I'm not that rich, of course, that's not, anyway, that's another, uh, <laughs> that's another conversation. But then for personal projects, I think this is, these are three things that I consider very important. That they are fun, so you have some enjoyment when doing them, uh, you can discuss the quality with yourself to see when you are um, satisfied with them or not. And um, time, well, that's another thing which we'll discuss right now. And it, this is mostly a reflection about how time influences my practice. And I don't know if you have the same experience or something else. Usually, and that's what I'm, uh, why I'm focusing on personal projects, because with commercial ones, I say that designers never end their projects. They have a date that they need to deliver it. You know, we have a deadline, and that's when, when you finish. Well, I, I highly envy people who actually can uh, finish their projects and put them out in the world and do something, because I'm constantly working on things forever and ever, as you see, that it's a it's something that um, is recurring in, in my life. So I'll comment briefly some projects and do something more expensive later. So this, uh, as Camille pointed out, the, the different materials, the elastics project was something that started at, uh, not don't believe the hype, but don't believe the type <laughs> in The Hague in 2010. And there was a workshop with uh, Sean Friedman where we had to do letters or lettering with uh, unconventional materials. And someone came in with this custom-made orange elastics and I started playing with them and really enjoying you know, how they would shape and form different ornaments and things. And of course I went for a B, like a, a letter out of it. And that then, like the only materials that I have, like with the elastics, I just put it with washi tape around. And that was it for a long time because, yeah, there were just those uh, elastic bands. Then uh, last year, I found those, like the same sort of elastic bands at, in, at Modular in Berlin, was I was there for Tipo. And then I was like, oh, fun. I can, I can experiment with them again. So I bought two packages. And that's all I could do with the two packages. So basically, instead of using the washi tape, I was uh, sewing with the invisible thread for things to be together, and you wouldn't have that ugly bend on top of it, right? But this, I think it's very related with, uh, if you think about the, I'll go back to that later, with the type life, with those letters that were there in the beginning. Uh, like this kind of, um, curves and how the elastic bends and create those shapes. You're not creating something that is super straight. This is what the material gets you to do, you know? And then, oh no, th that was, sorry, two years ago. And then last year, or this, I, I'm already lost in the calendar, but anyway, months later, I found other colors of elastic bands. Then I went on mixing colors and they're now, I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with things, so I bought like tons of elastics and now they are sitting in my drawer waiting for the next time when there will be a new idea or a new moment to come back to this project. And sometimes I don't know why I'm showing these things because they don't seem finished. There is not a specific purpose, not beyond experimenting with the, um, with the tool and the material and researching shapes. But then uh, last week, 
yeah, last week already, typographics uh, in New York. Um, there is the Dutch graphic designer, uh, Hansel van Halen, and she has amazing work with patterns and ornaments. I absolutely adore her work. And she just published a book, and she was saying how she included in the book sketches of things that are not ready yet, that maybe she'll come back to them at some point, and that she feels that by publishing it and making and putting it out in the world, it has a date, and it's also like a way of uh, claiming that that is her work. You know, that's, um, it's something like, oh, I'm doing this. You know, at some point I'll come back to it, but this is mine, <laughs> you know, I'm doing it. I don't know, but it's, it's something that I, you, you see with other projects that is like, it starts in one year, and then years later you do another piece of it, and then years later you do another piece of it. Maybe one day it'll be finished, maybe not. Uh, so that's the current state, the previous was the current state of the elastics. And I'm sure at some point, when I have the time, I'll create the whole alphabet with it and multiple colors and go bonkers. You send me an email at some time and say, oh, how is it going? Have you finished yet? Please do, if you want to. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is another project that is in my drawer and it started four years ago. Uh, you know, what, what happens when you have a bad experience, like you have a breakup? You go creative about it, right? There are so many songs and poems and things that are written and designed over, yeah, bad experiences, let's say. So, this, and this also came from uh, a few years ago, there was a workshop in Brazil with uh, Anthony Burrow that you might know for that poster, work hard and be nice to people, that is all over. And uh, there's a workshop that's called Mesa de Cadeira, and they put, like, it's a yeah, table and chair, and they put him on the um, top of the table. It's the, the that, that's when languages mix, and I forgot the word. But <laughs> yeah, so he was guiding the workshop, better, better say it. And we were t basically talking about how there are some sentences and some words that can be very general, in a sense and still very specific to someone. So you know, we like, like work hard and be nice to people. Or he does other projects with like, I like that, or I like it, or something like this. So there are very short sentences that are very broad in meaning, but to someone they can be super specific. So what happened back then is that I was working within an a, a advertising, freelancing within an advertising agency, and basically, like designing a uh, Thai project, and you know, advertising agencies in Sao Paulo is where you know there's a lot of men, and then women have to be you know sort of in high heels and smiling, and it's it's a whole other conversation. But then I was like you know working hard on a project and smiling on the outside. I was crushed inside. It was horrible. But then it was, you know I was listening to music the whole day, and then suddenly you hear something that resonates with what you're feeling, and then you write it down and you start making a list of things that make sense with what you're feeling, and then you start creating a story. So this is specific that because since part of the relationship was the long distance, there were a lot of text. So I re reread all the story, and I also highlighted things that we said to each other and mixed with the songs. And I was super tired of all of this and all the you know things within the agency, and you know how creative life can be with when you're working 24/7. You have client work and you have all people around. You just like sometimes you just want a break, right? You want to work on a project. You want some peace and quiet. So I went on a desert island. Like there was a advertisement for a desert island, like that's like a private island in um, in Sweden, and I was there for 10 days, and I wrote the like I calligraphed. Uh, designed and calligraphed the uh, 106 pages, which was the initial version of it. Th that's a, a whole story in itself. But then I felt it was not good enough, and I kept like the the following year, I, well, the following actually weeks, I came back to it and I did it again and again, and I just put it aside. And then with input from people that were seeing it, I came back to it over like the other the other year, and then I added to 36 pages, 
and which were, yeah, these were designed, I think, two years ago, three years ago. At some point, I put them up in my wall, thinking, okay, this is going to bother me enough that I'll come back to them. Um, I didn't. But, like, showing this to people and having feedback was one really, really good thing. Because every time someone would say, oh, have you seen this book? Or have you seen that project? Or have you seen those colors? Or have you thought about this printing method? And all of this input is helping me, like, bits and pieces in terms of advancing with the project. I think right now, or a bit further, is, um, and it's really important uh, to edit oneself and know when to stop and give it to another person to take care of it. Because collaboration work can be fantastic and can be, go much further than if you're doing it all by yourself. Well, with this project, I don't think it's not yet to the point that I'm okay to let it go to someone else to take care of it. Not because of the emotional bond, because that doesn't exist anymore, but then it's like down to the design decisions. And then I'm so still attached to some design decisions that I made that uh, it's not yet time to let go of it, but it will come. And then with the washi tape, uh, it states 2015 because I, th I think that's when I started with the posters. But for like way longer than that, I've been looking at signs. You know when you're going by a street and there's like wet paint and then people do it with masking tape? And there are so many other things that people use masking tape for, but they always do it with Roman letters, and they don't go together. Like, why haven't they tried to do with black letter before? It's so straight. It's so... Anyway. So, in 2015, I was invited for, uh, to create a poster for an exhibition in Brazil on lettering. And they were like, yeah, but you can use whatever paper and ink you want. I was like, is it okay if I don't use ink? They were, because it was uh, calligraphy and lettering, they were, they were highly confused, but then said, okay, let's, let's see what you come up with. And then I came up with uh, these posters that are basically washi tape, so there's no ink, but they say wet paint. So like the paint is dripping, but there's no paint involved, and it's all sort of black letter inspired. Um, and of course, I, like I did the first one, I was not happy with it, I didn't know what was going on, because it didn't have the um, pink layer on top, it was just silver, it was shining too much, and then I couldn't stop working until I was satisfied with the result, and instead of creating one, I ended up uh, like staying the whole night uh, working on this, and I created four. Well, they went to the gallery, some of them got sold, and it was okay, and then a year later, I was like, oh, what about exploring different tapes and different papers? Then, of course, I bought like 30 rows of tape. They are sitting there waiting for more experiments to come. And this was one of them. Uh, and then with ornaments, uh, this was uh, sort of a heart that it has a cross. Like it's and the other one is the, that reversed. And that I was experimenting with different tapes, with different colors of papers, with different materials. And then at some point, like I, I think I took the, the other one. This is in a, um, in a shop in The Hague. This will be maybe available for uh, purchase sometime soon. But it's also a project that is there waiting for me to feel when is that the right to go for the next step, right? And then this is something that I finally finished. <laughs> yeah, right? Like sometimes I do finish projects. Uh, I started that in 2016. I don't know if you have ever heard about uh, Ho'oponopono. It's sort of a mantra. Uh, it's a, based on a Hawaiian tradition of um, forgiveness and reconciliation. And there are four main sentences, which is, please forgive me, saying I'm sorry, thank you, I love you. And there was a sketching this uh, for different reasons, uh, and that went also went for the you know to my drawer, and then months later I picked it up. Oh, I should come back to this project, and I started checking you know different treatments with lines and other things, and then refining it. And when I scanned, 
I said, you know what? The first one that is messy, it's so much more related to the content of you know, allowing oneself and so much more free and interesting because when it's too getting too clean or if it's digital, it's like getting too perfect, it loses a sense of, you know, maybe being human. You know, then I thought that this collection had a lot to deal with not being perfect. And it is um, it's an exercise that I do myself, like all the time that I, to understand, that's one of the reasons why I work by hand so much, to understand that things don't need to be perfect and they are okay like that. And sometimes they are even more interesting because of it. So yeah, they end up like with the sketches, like with the lines and everything, like the rough sketches directly scanned from the old version and not with refined ones. Um, there are a few left that are here, not complete sets, but like few cards if someone wants to have them. Uh, and there was another one that went to do just after that, that this, this one that is out at the moment. Anyway, but this is finished, this is print, it is, and it's over. But another part of, um, and it's funny that the, I think that was the only letter drawing project, like lettering project that I included in the talk, because the biggest part of it is this one, that you know when Thai people, we, we go out in the streets and we do type safari, you know, photographing things that are interesting? I don't, I photograph patterns. I think letters are amazing and are beautiful and are interesting, but the thing that gets me the most is the, the order of patterns and colors and shapes interacting. So there are loads of them. Like I realized that I have loads of them on my phone and my computer from different cities and different things. But I didn't realize this until very, yeah, not recently, but it was 2004, I think 2003 or 2004 that I started drawing some ornaments based on historical ornaments uh, and experimenting with it. But that was the base that I took, like one of the sketchbooks that I took to the MA in London, to London College of Communication. And that's one of the things that got my tutor, Paul McNeil, to say, you know what, this is one of your interests. I think you're really pretty interested in this, so why don't you base your final project on type ornaments? And within the research, one of the things that I found was this monotype recorder that has a grammar of type ornament and is one of the best items in the ornament bibliography ever. And it basically talks about how you combine, uh, classifies the ornaments according to their shape. Um, and then according to their shape, you can think how many possibilities of combination they have. Uh, and it can be from just, you know, one, like a, something that it's like a square um, and it's a f like just a black square. It doesn't matter if you rotate it, it's always going to be a black square. So it's about the composition of that square within the page rather than how you're going combi to combine it. And then the, the one that has most options is the is a asymmetrical one that has a mirror image that gives eight possible positions and with those eight endless combinations. So I ended up with, with uh, like a big research, more of a research than actually a finished product. Uh, and I won't go deeper into that. But back then I felt that I needed to learn programming to be able to automate the pattern making. Um, and then uh, Type Media, years later, I learned um, Drawbot and Python programming with Jasper Rossum. And while everyone was doing letters and stuff, I was doing, as they say, shower curtains. Uh, <laughs> just, just patterns, they're like pretty patterns and shower curtains. But basically, every exercise had a purpose on how do I do this? Okay, these are the steps. How do I do that? These are the steps. And that gave me a pretty good base for going forward with my research. Back to Brazil, years later, um, there's a local letterpress printer called Eloisa Tovina that she has a great collection of uh, type ornaments. And as usual, I'm highly inspired by um, patterns within a city. And there's the sidewalk in Belo Horizonte. Uh, by chance, like Elo Eloisa is also from Minas Gerais. And then she invited me and another graphic designer, uh, Teresa Bettinardi, for a workshop at her place. 
And I came up with this, this one on the right, like, which is printed from that one on the left. And then we said, you know, this process with working with ornaments is pretty interesting. We could do something together. And we created a project that is called uh, Type Tiles. There's um, more information online in the portfolio. Also, there's an article that we wrote, which is on Medium, talking about every step of the project. This is the first version of Type Tiles. But then we spent a lot of time setting every part. And it was like, OK, you know what? We don't like this. And then get it apart and do it again and do it again and again. So for the second one, I created a system that each one of us would design four tiles that would be combined within themselves and also that had a lot of uh, combinations. And they were um, symmetrical in a diagonal position. So then the, you, can, you could rotate them. Like this basically, you have four different positions for each one of them, and they could interact with each other. Uh, and then I created a, a script within Drawbot to test those um, layouts before setting them in Letterpress. So that basically, you know, each one of these took like half an hour, which is pretty amazing for something that complex, like uh, half an hour to an hour. And this is one of the prints testing the, the four of them and their rotations. Then back to the Netherlands, there's the Letterpress workshop that is called Letterpress Amsterdam. And Thomas Ravemacher also has an impressive collection of type ornaments. And I came in and I saw some of the things. I was like, you know, I cannot, can I use them? He's like, yeah, sure, come in. And then I came back to the idea of the, the tiles are always the square. But then I was doing like smaller things that could be also combined with the others to create. And then it was like going crazy and overlapping things. And there are many more of this that are still in the drawer waiting for something. Uh, and <laughs> but during type media, I fell in love with this. And this little shape over there is called the Kaaba ornament. Many people know Bramdeus because of Trinité or Lexicon, which are typefaces that he created and are amazing. Sorry, but I don't care about them. They are beautiful, but this is the most brilliant ornament ever created. Why? Because it has, like, it's the asymmetrical shape within uh, a square bounding box and it has a mirror image, so therefore has eight different positions. And with those eight different positions, like this, there's A and B, so this is one of them, and you can rotate it, and there's a mirror image, and you can rotate it. This is the first time I, got, I saw the boxes with the original ornaments that were cast by Esrede years ago, which Bram used to work with. And they are only available for the printers from um, now I forgot the name of the, associ as the Association of Letterpress Printers in the Netherlands, uh, Druckwerk in the Marge. And then only them can work with the Kaaba, and they say, you know, they knew that I, I love it, so they said, you know, okay, you can work with it. The only condition is that you give whatever you'd make, you give a copy to Thomas, who has the workshop where I print, uh, to Sander, who was keeping the ornaments, and to Bram himself. I was like, yeah, sure. What am I going to do with it that he hasn't done himself? Because this green book over here on the left is a 500-page book with sketches, handmade sketches of things that he created with the, with the Kaaba. It's insane. Please look at them. Like, it's also, there's an article that I wrote about it online, which is, I think it's linked in the interview that Dave did with me. It's amazing. Uh, and then, like these are it's, these are original handwritten instructions from Bram on how to sketch with a Kaaba, and then he can sketch, you know, very kind of perfectly or with a uh, quick way, just doing a rough shape. And to have the opportunity to, to work with the original things was was quite amazing. Well, unfortunately, uh, I didn't get a chance to meet Bram and uh, give him whatever I created because he passed away. And in a way, it's really sad because I would love to talk to him about things and find out more about this project because it's so fantastic. But on the other hand, kind of freed me to do other things. So the first thing, when after he passed away, I would talk to Thomas and he was like, 
do you want to do a workshop here with the Kaaba? Like, hell yeah. So we did the first workshop last year, and this is uh, the press with, it's just insane because being perfect himself, um, Bram, like, he was so meticulous about everything, and the Kaaba only exists in 10 point uh, size, which is actually not 10 point, it's like nine point something. So you can only use spacing from Kaaba itself, and then putting in the bed of the press and everything else, it's, it's hell. But I love it. <laughs> and then after the workshop, I was able to do something for myself, and then which is in a, in a book from letterpress workers that was from last year. And then this year, we did another version of the workshop, uh, but then instead of doing many other things, we did them within squares, which was easier to set because we pre pre prepared the, the bed of the press for that. Again, me and the squares. And then every now and then, I go to Letterpress Amsterdam to talk to Thomas about things, and I look at the Kaaba, I was like, mm, hmm, let's do something. And I started the other day composing this, this shape, and I started one day and I thought about doing something that was huge. And I come back another day, and it, it's just, you know, there's no, with this one, there like there's no planning whatsoever. It's just taking one piece in my hand and feeling where it fits and which position it would be. And I was so very happy when it actually I printed and it was something interesting. And then with mirrors, you can check how it would reflect. And I liked it, so I created like the four parts of it. I did it four times. And this is the test print for that. And then since they are uh, squares in themselves, you can rotate them and have different uh, settings. And this is a project that we are still developing, probably printing this summer. We are still choosing colors and paper and other things, but it would be like this composition of eight prints. And with like with the ornaments, it's kind of a ornaments and patterns are like a, a long passion, like long time passion. And with the um, Moving to the Netherlands was one of the reasons was to have more time to just, you know, leave and be. Because in busy cities, like when you live in Sao Paulo, you're always rushing around, there's always something to do, uh, and you lose like so much time in traffic jams. Like, you know, go there, it's like two hours, go there, three hours, and here's one hour. And I was like, you know what? I don't want to waste all this time. I just want, you know, remember the desert island? I just want to be in a place where I can do things and have a peaceful life. You know, kind of almost going to the countryside and living in the woods, <laughs> but almost, not so much. So I moved to The Hague, and then enjoying some of the summer days, I just go to the park and write, uh, research about ornaments and things. And then I'm coming up, like this is something I started but haven't finished, and I'm coming up with this, a system for pattern making that is based on like three optical sizes and two halves of it. So basically five elements, and with these five elements, you can create small patterns for like mobile covers or big patterns for wallpapers and larger things. Uh, and when I was selecting this image, I thought it was kind of funny because at um, London College of Communication, they have an exercise that is basically based on the three basic shapes, like circle, square, and triangle, and I got the circle, and my first let, uh, a sentence for the report was like, I love being a circle, because I love you know, round shapes and things that move and curves. But then lately I found that you know, my basic shape is the square, because you can do so many things with it. And then suddenly I'm using this as a thing for, yeah, to, to illustrate the idea, and it's a circle within a square, uh, sorry, this is a I just love it. Um, then, since we're about talking about time, all of these projects, but what, I, what I want to say with them is like, there are certain times you feel things just click and they are right and they are ready. You don't need to do anything beyond that. I was just talking, there's a, a friend of mine here today, we went to college together, but he did fine arts where I did design. And a few months ago, he went to visit me in The Hague, and we were discussing about projects and processes and things, and today he was showing me some of his recent projects and collages, and it's like, you know, oh, oh maybe I stopped there. It's like, no, this is ready. And you just know when it's right. Um, 
this is the feeling that I have sometimes with the Kaaba and with other things. Uh, or the other ones, then you know, like it takes some time, it takes years for something to be ready. But maybe they don't even need to see the light of day. They don't need to be ready. They just need to be whatever they are because they are part of your process and your research. And also there's a timing when things make sense. And despite doing so many other things myself and in projects like uh, lettering projects and projects for clients and things to do like for myself, I also have worked so many years behind the scenes uh, and now I'm part of, uh, well, this is the second time that I'm part of Type Network. I don't know if you have heard about it, but we launched one year ago. And it's a collective of independent, it's an alliance of independent foundries. And I was so surprised when they invited me a few years ago to join and to do marketing. I was like, I'm horrible at marketing. I don't know how to do it from, you know, I, my, I brought business cards to the trip. I don't know where they are. They are somewhere in the luggage. When I try to get them, they always hide. I find them when I'm packing, but they always hide when I need them. Uh, I barely post on you know, Instagram and things. I um, don't work with social media. I just know how to do it for others. I, well, as I recently found out, but not for myself. Uh, so I joined the marketing team, the content team. And uh, I'm showing this because this is a recent release. We just released it this week. It's Beat Count by Ty Petter. Uh, Better from Blockland. And he created this pixel font, and you can read more about it in the website. But then he's like, you know what? You have this great toolbox to work with. So I started, of course, creating patterns with it for the story, right? And then there are this, we had to promote it. So I created this tile of mini cards that I have some of them here for you if you want. Oops. So there are 25 designs. <laughs> they are not, uh, yeah, it's difficult to get all the 25 to make a complete tile, but then, yeah, there are 25 designs and you can play with them and rotate them and whatever. And then, you know, why not? Bit count is just straight, it's based on a grid and things like that, so why not make it in tape? <laughs> so then besides working during the day, working with them, I spend my free time working with other things that are still related. Anyway, this is acetate. That's why like, that final shadow, it's an actual shadow, because you can see through the, through the paper. Uh, so then also working at Type Network. People say, oh, you're a type designer at Type Network. And I'm thinking, no, uh, I'm a type designer, but I'm not a type designer at Type Network because I do foundry relations and graphics and planning and marketing. And I was actually thinking a lot about the people that I work with while I was answering the questions that Dave asked me. And in terms of collaboration, I love working with the team that I have and working with another person for graphics with Claire Lindsay. She rocks. Anyway, this is, this is, it's a long chapter, but I love my team, Eve Peters, um, Samuel Riggs, uh, Karen Lederland, Bailey Dreyer, love you guys. Um, so it's one of the best. Like it's act I never worked for someone, like was always freelancer. And this is not a job, like I'm a contractor, a freelancer, but it's the best job I ever had. Um, but anyway, I'm a type designer and I, have, I work at Type Network, so it's like, when do you launch a foundry? When do you launch a foundry? One of like the typeface that you've been seeing through the presentation is my final project at Type Media, which is from six years ago. <laughs> uh, it's called Chic, uh, and it has uh, basically it's a system that has uh, basic uh, sans for the text, which is something you know for it's it's a, it has a relation with a woman's wardrobe. So it's for you know casual dressing, like everyday, easy, basic outfits. Then it has a display for when you want to dress up. It's the prêt à porter, uh, and then it's the super display with the ornamental caps, which is the couture. And the idea that the couture is um, I was highly inspired by Dior gowns. I don't have many dreams of things in terms of projects. But at some point, collaborating in a you know, Dior Couture is, a, is actually a dream. <laughs> maybe one day it happened, maybe not. Uh, yeah, this is the system. 
is uh, well, this, the, these are digital, and the top one was all handmade. It still needs to be digitized. Well, it's digitized, but just live tracing or something like that. And these are not supposed to be that big, but they are big just to show them. And looking at them, I like, oh, I want to change this, I want to change that, I want to change that. So maybe one day I'll finish, or maybe not. Who knows? But the thing that is the bottom line and the end of the day, this is a word in Portuguese that means trust. I designed it for a friend who wanted to tattoo herself, so she has a tattoo on her arm. And it's for her, it's like many personal reasons, but the basic thing is like, you know, trust the universe is going to get you the right thing. So maybe one day, maybe not, just trust and go with your guts. Thank you. Merci. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Je ne sais pas le dire en anglais, mais c'était très émouvant. <laughs> um, perhaps uh, I just want to ask a first question, and then I will ask uh, to other people. You you spoke a lot about time in your yeah. in your designing process. Do you think that? Um, Working with and uh, and lettering is part of a strategy, perhaps, to make a slower design and to to make it not so fast and not so crazy. Yes, most definitely, because when you're working within the computer, uh, things already kind of seem finished. You want like it working with vectors, like it looks already so perfect. Then you want to go straight away into details and start tweaking things before, at least that's my feeling, of before exploring different options. So when you're working by hand, you're like, oh, what if this, what if that? And you can quickly make some sketches and then have, like, make some decisions before going, if you ever need to go into the digital part. Uh, so yeah, working by hand like, slows down the, proje the process a lot in a way, but then makes it faster in another, like that you're making mistakes faster, you're testing um, possibilities faster, but also like makes your eyes analyze things in a you know in a, in a different pace. That's that's how I feel. That's like yeah, it is it is on purpose as well. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Is there any question? Fun. Ah. I was going to say, Bib, it's too warm and people don't just want to go <laughs> have a shower. How do you um, manage your personal projects when with your professional projects? Well, clearly I don't. They take years. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, but it's like, yeah, it's, um, it's something that... Some t There's one thing that, like, well, I learned many things from my father, but one thing that I learned from him that I... That's something I think constantly about is in terms like if you really want to do something, you have a, it, like it becomes your priority. When you have a priority, you go for it. Um, and then if you're feeling strongly about something, you test it and you go for it. And that's how I feel about my personal projects. When I have the urge to do something, it doesn't matter if I spend the whole night working on it, I just need to do it until it's finished. And that's it. <laughs> okay. I have uh, one question. When uh, everything you show seems to be very personal, yeah. um, you seem to experiment more than working. Yeah. Yes. W why? Uh, why is it like that? Why you you feel like a, a student uh, who want to try a lot of things, yeah. but not actually have clients or work? It feels that you are very, I will say, you have a lot of freedom. You seem to do what you want, but oh, why is it like that? It's very surprising to see someone like you still at it's it's look you still at school 
or not not on real life yeah yes I your life that. is a dream or something like that <laughs> i don't know well thank you i i i think it i'm pretty happy with my life uh <laughs> if i may say that yeah um well i do experiment a lot and i think that also informs my commercial work so there are many things like for instance the 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 cards for type network is something that I could only do because I have experience with so many other things that are related with the letterpress, with the ornaments and with the patterns. So that was something that was pretty clear to me that I, I could do and I could do fast, like within the time that we had uh, to have them printed. And every time, you know, when I give a briefing to students and like we did today, is like pushing them forward to think outside the box and like um, explore different territories and possibilities and push them forward. Well, if I'm asking other people to do that, I also did need to do that myself, right? So there was a time when I felt quite kind of stuck in the, when, I, when I went to the island and I was doing the, the book. I look at the things that I were doing, it's like, you know, this is pretty boring and it's pretty standard. I need to, you know, uh, amp, this and like pump up game or whatever. And in the final days that I was there, I started experimenting with um, reverse contrast, but not as we know in terms of thin verticals and horizontal and thick horizontals. But when you do it with, uh, when you do calligraphy with a pointed, with a pointed pen, well, yeah. Uh, you do thick downstrokes and thin upstrokes. It was like, so what if the reverse contrast is in the pointed pen calligraphy? If you use a, a brush pen, and you do thin downstrokes and thick upstrokes, that changes, like totally changes the, the feeling of the letter. And I started experimenting that and then ended up in, um, in a commercial project. So also a lot of the exercises that I'm doing, it helps inform my commercial work. So it's not like, it's just some of the things are very personal and they stay in the, you know, in the drawers and maybe one day they will come out, they will have a end result or not, and then we'll come do once. I also get bored pretty fast, uh, so I like to move from one thing to the other, and maybe that's why I don't have enough patience to finish my type design, which, well, type design takes a lot of time, uh, and that's why I love also my job at Type Network, because I have so many different things within the company that feels like many different, like, separate freelance projects instead of one long, continuous thing. Um, yeah, one, one thing informs the other. And it's, it, it is a pretty big and ongoing laboratory. And I think it's very important to, to, to try new things. Because, well, we've seen the old ones over and over, right? So why not try something new? Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, um, no more questions. So we will uh, end up the live stream tonight. Thank you, Marina, to be there with us. Thank you. Thank you for the time with the um, attendees of Type Paris all the day. It was my pleasure. They enjoy a lot what you have done with them. That's they told great. me, I've been told, <laughs> whatever. Okay, bye bye, yeah. the web, bye bye, the world. Bye. We are back in Paris together. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.